First Shay's story time. Take it away. Hello, everyone. I am Shay. Um, last week, uh, we decided to um, try something a little different um, on our streams. Um, I'm Shay from Party Wave Gaming. Uh, we do RPGs and stuff. Um, so on Fridays, uh, I began to start reading a book. Um, I drew, draw a lot of inspiration from various novels and books and stories that I read, whether um, fictional or mythological or what. Ever, but um, uh, as uh, so, if you're if you're interested and in just like listening to the story and just enjoying it, that's fine too. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes, and if it pans out and people enjoy it, then we'll continue doing that. Um, and uh, just to refresh everyone. Um, we began reading a book called Shipbreaker um, by Paolo Bacigalupi. Very difficult name to pronounce, and I'm probably going to be mispronouncing a lot of things. Uh, so I hope you bear with me, and I do hope you all enjoyed the story. Uh, last time, it, it was a story, and so far we found that um, it's in a post-apocalyptic setting um there's essentially a new way of life for people um calorie companies pretty much run the world um so it got a little bit of dystopian in there um there's uh this story is going to be following a kid named uh nailer who is a shipbreaker part of his job is to go inside giant rusty oil tankers and pretty much carve out the precious metals that were used in it to be used in um, new stuff these kind of people do not get paid well if at all um, last time he went in one of his crewmates who swore a blood oath uh, betrayed him because they found some oil and she tried to let him die he somehow got lucky enough to get out. Lucky and smart. Um, but um, as a result of this, he had a very good night of not almost dying, even though he's in a lot of pain, and uh, went home to his drunk father, who is very abusive. And that's about where we're going to be picking up. So grab your blankets, grab your tea. My tea's still too hot to drink. And uh, I don't want to burn off my tongue because I need that to, to tell this story. Um, but um, also, anyone who's in chat, feel free to uh, feel free to ask questions or or make comments or whatever you want to do. Um, I'll be watching uh, the stream as well, so. Um, yeah. Rin, uh, anything else we should go over or? Nope, I think we're more or less good. Hello, hello everyone. Golden WH, hello, welcome fellow demi-human. Hello, Golden WH. What does WH stand for? I'm curious. What does the WH stand for? This probably has a Oh, there's the tip jar on the left side. They have, they have never told anyone. It's a so mystery. I see. <laughs> All right. Well, Golden WH, um, I am going to be uh, continuing a story that we um, that we. I like that Waller's hands. <laughs> um, Darn. Let's make it canon. Gene modification. Yes. Um, Hey, there's gene modification in this book, so we'll get yes. to see some of the results of that. Um, but we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, I will be picking up this story um, where we left off. Naylor in his room, uh, or avoiding his abusive dad. Anywho, 
without further ado. This is chapter six of Shipbreaker. The storm rolled onto the coast with all the implicable power of an old well an old world tank. Towering clouds towering cloud banks built on the horizon and then swept inward, bearing steady rain. Thunder grumbled over the ocean, and lightning lit the underbellies of the clouds, flashing from sea to sky and back again. The deluge opened. Naylor woke to the roar of, of storm on bamboo walls. Wind and water poured in through the open door, lit by explosions of electricity. His father was just a shadow, slumped beside him, mouth open, snoring. Wind whirled through the house scraping Naylor's face with cold fingers, then leaping to the wall and tearing away Naylor's picture of the clipper ship. The paper swirled madly for a moment before being sucked out the window and into the darkness, disappearing before Naylor could even try to grab it. Rain spattered his skin, coming in cold where palm thatching was already tearing away under the increasing battery of the winds. Naylor crawled over, over his father and stumbled to the door. Outside, the beach was swarmed with activity. People moving, people moving skiffs deeper into the trees, chasing after livestock. The storm looked worse than just a blow, maybe a city killer even. The way the clouds swirled and scattered, lightning across, uh, across the wrecks offshore, even though the tide, even though the tide should have been out, the waves and breakers were big all across the beach. The storm surge was pressing inland. His father claimed that the storms were worse every year, but Naylor had never seen anything like the monster bearing down on them. He turned back into the shack. Dad, he shouted, everyone's moving higher. We need to get out of the surge. His father didn't respond. The night crews were Pouring off the wrecks, men and women scrambling down hemp ladders, dangling and dropping like fleas, jumping from a dog, plummeting into the increasing surf. Electricity outlined the black holes against day bright sky when everything disappeared into blackness. Rain slashed the beach. Naylor scrambled around the shack looking for possessions to salvage. He tugged on his last set of clothes, grabbed the phosphor grease found his silver earring, and the luck bag of rice that he had been given. The house creaked and healed as wind gusted. The tent and bebe wouldn't last long. The storm was a, city, was a city killer for sure, what some people called a party wrecker or an Orleans, Orleans surge. When Naylor peered back out into the storm's rage, he could see now that everyone was fleeing for heavy shelter. Shadow people clawing out of the darkness hunched against curtains of wind and water as they dashed for safety, running for things like the salvage train with its iron freight cars that might not fly away. Naylor dragged all their possessions over to his father's inert form pulled the sheet off the bed, and fumbled one-handed with their belongings. His wounded shoulder burned with pain at the frantic effort. He shoved everything into the sheet, tied it into a bundle. More rain poured through the disintegrating thatch. His father's pale skin green gleamed with rainwater, and yet he still did not move. Naylor grabbed a tattooed arm. Dad! No response. Dad! Naylor. Naylor shook him again, tried to drive his nails into the man's dragon-decorated flesh. Wake up! Then the man bar barely stirred, so, so deep into amphetamine blowout that nothing affected him. Naylor rocked back on his heels, suddenly thoughtful. If they took the full brunt of the city killer, there wouldn't be anything left here. He heard that sometimes a surge could move... Could move the coastland inland as much as a mile, turning beaches and trees into a murky swamp sea. The new ragged tide line of rising sea levels, whoops, excuse me, 
turning the beaches and trees into a murky swamp sea, the new ragtie line of rising sea levels. A big blow could be could easily move the hulls of the ships as well. Might move them right over the house, even if it didn't blow away. Naylor straightened. He hefted the sheet, groaning at the cumbersome load. When he reached the doorway, the wind blasted him, lashing his face and sand and leaves. More lightning slashed the beach, and in the flickering light, a chicken coop tumbled past, all birds already gone, every one of them lost to the gray roar. Naylor looked back at his father, conflicted emotions warring within him. The man wasn't moving. The chemicals in his brain were so depleted, he wasn't going to come awake even for the storm. Sometimes when the crash was bad, his father could sleep for two days. Naylor normally blessed the peace his father's drug crashes brought. It would be so much simpler. Naylor set down the sack of his possessions, cursing himself for his own stupidity. He plunged into the storm. The man was a drunk and a bastard, but still, they were blood. They shared the same eyes, the same memories of his mother, the same food, the same liquor, family, as much as he had. A maelstrom of sand and copper screws and plastic shards swirled around him, the debris of the ship-breaking business ripping at his, at his skin as he ran barefoot down the beach to clean the shack. Rust flakes, bits of insulation, a roll of wire, trash stripping, trash strippings flying like knives. A gust of wind drove Nailer to his knees and sent him crawling. His shoulder a bright blossom of pain. Sheet metal whipped overhead, flying like a kite. A roof. A bit of ship. It was impossible to tell. It slashed into a coconut palm and the tree toppled. But the blast of the storm was so loud, Naylor couldn't hear the collapse. Crouched in the sand, he squinted through gushing rain. Pima Shack was gone, but the shadows of the girl and her mother were still there, fighting the storm, trailing ropes, struggling to hold onto a blurry shadow. Naylor had always thought of Pima's mother as a as a big as big from her work on the on the heavy crew, but. Now in the storm, she seemed as small as law. The rain cleared briefly. Sanda and Pima were lashing down the skiff, trying, tying it to a tree trunk as it bent in, and as it bent in the wind. Debris scoured them. When he got close, he could see that Pima had taken a cut to her face, and blood ran freely from her forehead, even as she worked with her mother to secure the lines. Nailer! Pima's mother waved him over. Help Pima hold that side! She threw him a line. He twisted it around his good arm and hauled the, t and hauled the two of them, handling one end of the skiff shoulder to shoulder as Pima made the knots fast. As soon as it was knotted, Pima's mother motioned him and shouted, Get up into the trees! There's a rock hollow higher up! It should get shelter! Nailer shook his head. My dad! He waved back at his own shack, the, a shadow still miraculously upright. He won't wake up. Pima's mother stared through the blackness and rain toward the shack, her lips pursed. Hell. All right. She waved at Pima. You take him up. The last thing Naylor saw was Sadness shadow plunge, plunging into the, into the wind, running down the beach, surrounded by lightning strikes. And then Pima was dragging him up into the trees scrambling through the whipping branches in the roar of the storm. They climbed wildly, desperate to get out of the surge. Naylor looked back again and at the beach and saw nothing. Pima's mother was gone. His father's shack. Everything. The beach was scoured clean. Out, of the, out on the water, fires burned. Oil somehow ignited, the blazing, ignited and blazing despite the torrents. Come on, Pima tugged him onward. It's still a long way. They fled deeper into the jungle, scrambling through mud and stumbling over thick cypress roots. Torrents of water rushed down over them, 
filling the wood-cutting trails of the forest with their own muddy rivers. At last, they reached Pima's destination, a small limestone cave barely big enough to hold them both. They crouched within. Rainwater poured over the brink in a miserable torrent. It pulled around them so that they huddled ankle-deep in cold water. Still, it was sheltered from the wind. Naylor stared out at the storm. A city killer, for sure. Pima started. I... Shh. She pulled him back from the water, deeper into the hole. She'll be fine. She's tough. Tougher than any storm. A tree flew past, flying as if it were a toothpick flung by a child. Naylor bit his lip and hoped that Pima was right. He'd been a fool to ask for help. Pima's mother was worth a hundred of his dad. They waited, shivering. Pima tugged him closer and they huddled together, sharing heat, waiting for nature's violence to pass. Whew. So, to everyone who's watching, um, I have more respect for parents who are reading books to their kids because this does actually take effort. I want to see if my tea is actually drinkable now. Gotta get those sips. Oh my gosh, that is so good. White acai tea. Made it myself. I love it. It's so delicious. So soothing. Still hot. Okay. Back to the store. The storm raged for two nights. Trashing the coastline, tearing away anything that wasn't tied down. Pima and Naylor huddled through it, watching the roar and rain, and holding close as their lips turned purple and their skin and their skin pimpled with cold. On the third day in the morning, the sky suddenly cleared. Naylor and, Pima, Naylor and Pima forced their stiff limbs to move and stumbled out down onto the beach, joining a ragged assembly assemblage of other survivors who were streaming toward the sands. They broke through the last of the trees and Naylor stopped, dumbstruck. The beach was empty. Not a sign of human habitation. Out on the blue water, the shadows of the oil tanker still loomed, randomly scattered like toys, but nothing else remained. The soot was gone, the oil in the waters, everything shone brightly under the blaze of the morning tropic sun. So blue, he even muttered. I don't think I've ever seen the water so blue. Hale couldn't speak. The beach was cleaner than he'd ever seen in his life. You're alive, huh? Moon Girl grinning at them, covered with mud from whatever bolt hole she'd found, but alive nevertheless. Behind her, Pearlie and his parents were coming onto the beach, shocked expressions on their faces as they tried to register the changes. All in one piece, Pima searched down the beach. You see my mom? Moon Girl shook her head, her piercings glinting in the sun. She might be over there. She waved vaguely toward the train yard. Lucky Strike's giving out food to anyone who wants it. Credit for everyone until ship breaking starts again. He saved food? A couple rail cars full. Pima Tug Nailer. Come on. A crowd of people were gathered around the scavenge train, all of them waiting for Lucky Strike to dole out supplies. Pima and Naylor scanned the faces, but there was no sign of sadness. Lucky Strike was laughing and saying, No worries. We got enough for everyone. No one's starving while we wait for old Lawson and Carlson to come back from Miss Met. The rust, the rust buyers might be hiding from hurricanes, but Lucky Strike's taking care of everyone. Lucky Strike was grinning, his long black dreadlocks tied back, but Naylor knew he was also telling people there wouldn't, wouldn't be any rioting for food, and if there was any, and if there was anyone people could obey, would obey, it was Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike had been collecting real power ever since his first bit of luck freed him from the heavy crew. 
Now he smuggled everything from antibiotics to the crystal slide into his bright sands beach. He had deals worked with the he had deals worked with the boss men to do whatever he liked. His hand was in the gambling tins and the nail sheds and a dozen other businesses, and the money just rolled in, turning into gold nuggets that he that he hung glittering from the tips of his dreadlocks, or else drove through his ears in thick waving rings. The man dripped wealth. Keep back, Lucky Strike shouted. Keep on back. He was smiling and looked confident, but he had a line of hired goons standing behind him to back up his authority. Naylor scanned the arrayed thugs, recognizing some of the killers that his father ran. It seemed like Lucky Strike had collected the best of the worst for his protection. Even the half-man was there. The monster's huge muscle form loomed over the rest of the thugs his dog-like muzzle snarling and showing his teeth to scare back hungry people. Pima caught the direction of Naylor's gaze. That's the one my mom's heavy crew used to pull iron, pull sheet iron. She said he could lift four times what a man could. What's it doing up there? Must have figured out that working, working muscle for Lucky Strike pays better than heavy crew. The half-man bared its fangs and rumbled a warning. The crowds that had been closing in on the train cars backed off. Lucky Strike laughed. Well, at least you all listened to my killer dog, huh? That's right. Everybody step back or my friend Tool here will teach you a lesson in manners. I mean it. Everyone, give us some space. If Tool doesn't like you, he'll eat you raw. The crowd mumbled discontent, but they gave way under Tool's feet. Pima! Naylor and Pima turned at the shout. It was Sadna, hurrying towards them. Naylor's father in tow. Sadna swept up to hug Pima. Naylor's ha father hal halted a step behind. He inclined his head. Guess you saved my ass, lucky boy. Naylor nodded carefully. Guess so. Suddenly, his father laughed and grabbed him. Damn, boy. You're not going to hug your old man? It hurt Naylor's stitches, and Naylor winced in the man's grip, but he didn't fight the embrace. His dad said, I woke up in the middle of the damn storm and had no idea what the hell was going on. Almost killed Santa before she explained things. Naylor glanced worriedly at Pima's mother, but Santa just shrugged. We wiped it out. Damn right, his dad grinned and touched his jaw. His jaw. She hits like a sledgehammer. For a moment, Naylor worried that his father was carrying a grudge, but for once the man wasn't sliding high. He seemed almost rational, as clean as the beach. Already he was craning his neck to see how food was being distributed. Tools up there? He laughed and clapped Naylor on the shoulder. If Lucky Strake will hire that dog, damn sure he'll take me. We'll eat good tonight. He began shoving through the crowd toward Lucky Strike's scarred detail. He didn't look back at Sadna, or Naylor, or Huma at all. Naylor breathed a sigh of relief. No hard feelings, said. The inventory of the beach and the shipbreakers continued. Rumor had it they'd missed the heart of the storm. It had passed to the east, up the Orleans Alley, roaring through the old city ruins, and then tearing farther north into the sea. Wreckage of Orleans, too, damage all the way up through the guts of the place, people said, which meant they'd been lucky at Bright Sands and missed being flattened. Even with a glancing blow from the storm, the damage to Bright Sands Beach was immense. They found bodies everywhere, tangled in kudzu vines of the jungle, stuck in the trees high up, floating out in the surf, Lucky Strike organized scavenge parties to take care of the dead, burning them or buying them according to their rituals, and making the place safe from disease. Names rolled in. Bappy had gone misty, either torn apart in the storm or drowned, but gone nonetheless. No one knew if Sloth was alive or dead. TikTok and his entire family were found. Sad. No sign of damage on them, but all of them dead anyway. 
all the scrap and rust buyers who contracted with Wal- Lawson and Carlson had fled inland to wait out the storm with no companies like GE buying scrap for their manufacturing operations or shipping companies like Patel Global Transit looking to buy scavenge to sell overseas. The shipbreaking yards were idle. The accountants and assayers and corporate guards who weighed and purchased the raw materials that came off the wrecks had left, and with no one around to buy their product, the shipbreakers used the days cutting and renewing their shacks, scavenging the jungle and fishing for food in the ocean until things got organized. People were on their own. Pima and Naylor went scavenging for food, collecting green coconuts that had fallen before turning to the pools and the tides. Out in the distance, the outcrop point of an island was visible. There's crabs out that way, Pima said. Yeah? Should we go that far? Pima shrugged. Better scavenge without competition, right? She indicated the, the silent ships. It's not like anyone's going to miss us. They took a hemp sack and a bucket and went seeking, working their way across the sand, out along the spit that had let, that had led on led to the island. All around the ocean was glittering was a glittering mirror. Breakers rolled up to the shore, white as baby's teeth. The black holes of the broken ships stood out in the sun, looming monuments to a world that had fallen apart. Far out on the horizon, a clipper ship skated the ocean, its high sail unfurled. Nipper Paul, Nailer paused in his collections and watched as it carved across the blue water. So close, and yet so far. You going to keep daydreaming there? He masked. Sorry, Nailer bent and ran his hand through another tide pool, wincing a bit at the movement, but still feeling better than he had in days. His bruises were almost all faded, even if his arm was still in a sling, and even if there was an annoying burn of soreness in his shoulder. They continued out along the promena- promena- promontory. I can spell. In places, they could look down through clear waters and see where old houses had been built, their concrete foundations showing in the deeps. Check it out, Pima said, pointing. That one must have been a huge house. If they were so rich, Naylor asked, why did they build where they were going to be drowned? Well, if I know. Even rich people are stupid, I guess, Pima pointed out. Deeper into the bay. Not as stupid as the ones who made the teeth, though. The waters over the teeth were calm a light breeze ripping across them. A few black struts and chunks of construction protruded up through the waves beneath the surface. Tall brick and steel buildings lurked, their crumbling structures hidden by the water. The people who had built the teeth had misjudged the sea rise quite a lot. The only time any of the buildings showed at all was at low tide. The rest of the time, the city ruins were entirely hidden. You ever wonder if there's any good scavenge down there? Mailer asked. Not really. People had plenty of time to strip the easy stuff. Yeah, but still, there must be some iron steel we could recover. Stuff that wasn't so scarce when they gave up. No one's going after rusty steel when they've got all these ships to gut. Yeah, I guess so. Still, it called him to think of what wealth might lie beneath the waves. They waited around the rich people's ruins the, and continued across the spit, aiming for the green tuft of the island. The last bit of distance was a wide sand, was a wide sand plain revealed in the low tide that made easy walking. So, just so you all know, the teeth are skyscrapers, if you hadn't picked that up. They reached the island and climbed through the trees and kudzu vines and bushes, making good time, even with Naylor's bad shoulder. They crested the island, 
the wide blue ocean came into view. It was almost as if they were out in the middle of the ocean now, so far offshore. With the wind coming off the water, Naylor could pretend he was actually on a deep-sea vessel speeding towards the horizon. He started out to the curve of the earth, to the far side of the world. Wish you were here, he murmured. Yeah. This was as close as he would ever come to the deep ocean. If he thought about it too much, it hurt. Some people were born lucky and sailed on clipper ships. And then there were beach rats, like him and Pima. Naylor tore his eyes from the horizon and scanned the bay. In the deep water, the shadows of the teeth undulated. Sometimes ships caught on the teeth as if they weren't familiar with the local coast. He'd seen a fisher. He'd seen a fisher hang up and sink on the old struts. Excuse me. He had seen a fisher hang up and sink on the old on bleh, hang up and sink on the old struts when it had ran itself into the whole mass of the towers and then been unus unable to, to win free. Some of the shipbreakers had gone down swimming for the scavenge, depending on low tide levels. Teeth, the teeth had a real bite. Come on, Pima said. You don't want to get caught out here by the tide. Naylor followed, working his way down slope, letting Pima help him over the rough sections. Your dad get drunk yet? Pima asked suddenly. Naylor thought back on the morning and his father's good mood. The man, sharp-eyed and laughing and ready for the day, but also jittery the way he was when he didn't have his crystal slide or a handful of red rippers. He should be good for a while yet. Lucky Strike won't let him crack heads unless he's clean. Probably won't start until tonight. I don't know why you saved his ass, Pima said. All he does is hit you. Naylor shrugged. The island's overgrowth was surprisingly thick, and he had to push it aside to keep from whipping him in the face as he forced through. He didn't used to. He used to be different before all the drugs, before my mom died. Hello, everyone. Hello, Diesel Shot. How are you doing? I'm noticing that it's not uh, documenting our viewers, which is weird because there Say are. What? It's not showing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Numbers. It's very weird. I noticed that as well, but <clears throat> we have people... obviously it's wrong. We have people in here. There are, I can confirm that there are five not bots sitting in here, including Golden, <laughs> Diesel, as yourself. Batmon Gaming is a real person. So I'm not sure why it's not showing anybody, but it's going to oh. mess up our, our numbers. Hmm? You said, oh? Uh, I think it just updated. I see six. It just updated. It's not showing that. Hello? Is it showing that? Oh, yeah, there it is. There's six. I guess you just have to complain. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you Whoop. hear me? I think I'm bugged. I'm going to disconnect and reconnect. Okay. Sounds like she's bugged. All right. Can you hear me now? I've heard you the whole time. Awesome. I could not hear anything else. Okay. Little and hiccup. It might be OBS acting up. Then everything else seems to be fine with OBS. It's just not recording viewership but hey six is good that's double last time fantastic i'm glad people are enjoying this you're doing a great job well why i have a break i'm gonna take a sip from my gas iot very delicious if you have tea enjoy it right now enjoy that tea oh my god i just spilled it all over myself Oh, this makes me sad. I need to um, be right back.
apologies. That's what I get for you for for trying to cap and protect my electronics, and I just get it for myself instead. Womp womp. Which, which is better than you know getting it on the electronics, but still, I got it on my book. And I won't tell you the other places I got it. Front row. That's okay, though. Alrighty. You're good to continue, then, yes? Yes. Um, some of my book pages might be a little wrinkly now, but that's okay. It gets in character. Yeah, they'll recover. It'll be fine. Okay. Apologies, everyone. Let's see. Where did I leave off? Here we are. It used to be different before all the drugs and before my mom died. It wasn't that great before. It's just worse now. Naylor grimaced. Yeah, well, he shrugged, stimmied by conflicted emotions. I probably wouldn't have made it out of the oil room if it weren't for him. He's the one who taught me to swim. I think I don't owe him something for that. Depends on how many days, how many times a day he cracks your head. Puma made a face. You give him enough chances, he's going to kill you. Naylor didn't respond. If he thought about it too much, he didn't know why he saved his father either. It wasn't like Richard Lopez made his life any easier. Probably it was because people said family was important. Pearlie said it. Pima's mom said it. Everyone said it. And Richard Lopez, whatever else he was, was the only family Naylor had left. Still, Naylor couldn't help wishing that he ended up with Sadna and Pima, and not Richard Lopez. He wondered what it would be like to live in their shack all the time, and not just when his father was sliding high. To know that he wouldn't have to leave after a day or two and return to his father's place to live with people you could count on to protect your back. The undergrowth opened. They stepped out amongst the tide pools and jagged rocks of the island's tip. Granite intrusions poked above the water and formed a sort of breakwater that defended the island from some of the worst of the new storms. Pima started scooping up storm-stunned croakers and small redfish throwing them into her bucket. There's a lot of fish. More than I thought. Naylor didn't answer. He stared at the rocks beyond. Between them, something reflected like glass glinting and white. Hey, Pima. He tugged on her shoulder. Look at that. Pima straightened. What the hell? That's a clipper ship, isn't it? He swallowed, took a step forward. Stopped. Was it a mirage? He kept expecting it to evaporate. The white boards and fluttering silk and canvas remained. It is. It has to be. It's a clipper. Pima laughed softly behind him. No. You're wrong, Naylor. That's not a clipper ship at all. Suddenly she dashed past him, sprinting for the ship. That scavenge. Her laughter floated back to him on the wind, teasing him. Naylor shook himself out of his stupor and dashed after her. A whoop of joy escaped his lips as he ran across the sand. Ahead, the gold white hole of the wreck gleamed in the sunlight, beckoning. It's a rich people ship. I'm sure everything will be fine. The ship lay on its side, swamped and broken. Its back snapped, even de even destroyed. It was a beautiful thing, unlike the utterly unlike the rusting iron and steel holes they tore apart every day. Excuse me, one moment. There we go. Sorry about that. The clipper was big, a ship used for fast transit and freight on the pole run over the top of the world to Russia and Nippon. 
or else across through the Atlantic to Africa and Europe. Its hydrofoils were retracted, but the carbon polymer hole shattered. Naylor could see into its workings. The huge gears that extended the foils, the complex hydraulics, and precision electronic systems. The ship's deck was tilted towards them, showing a, showing a buckle cannon and the high-speed reels for the parasails. Once, when Bappy was in a good mood, the man had told Naylor that the big cannon would send a sail thousands of feet into the air to catch high winds that, w that would then yank the ship onto, onto its hydrofoils and take it skimming across the waves at speeds faster than 50 knots. Naylor and Pima stopped short, staring at the looming wreckage. Fates, it's beautiful, Pima breathed. Even dead, it looks like a regal hawk. Cracked and shattered, but with a beauty still inherent thanks to the feral grace of its lines. It had the sleek, aerodynamic design of a hunter. Every angle purpose-built to reduce drag and the mere, to the merest fraction. Naylor's eyes swept over the broken clipper ship's upper decks. The pontoons and stabilizers and the cracked remains of the fixed wings, wing sails. All of it white almost blazing white in the sun, not a bit of soot or rust anywhere. There wasn't a drop of oil leaking despite the shattered hull. Back at the shipbreaking yards, the, the old tankers and freighters were nothing in comparison, just rusting dinosaurs, useless without the precious oil that had once fueled them. Now they were nothing but great wallowing brutes, leaking their grime and toxins into the water. Reeking and destructive when they've been created. Reeking and destructive when they be cre when they had been created, and in the accelerated age, and still destructive even after they were dead. The clipper was something else entirely. A machine angels had built. The name on the prow was unreadable to either of them, but Pima recognized one of the words below. It's from Boston she said. How do you know? Naylor asked. One of my light crews worked on a Boston freight ship and it had the same word. I saw it on every single door in the whole damn wreck while we were taking it apart. I don't remember that. It was before you got on crew, she paused. The first letter's B and it's got the S, the one that looks like a snake. So it's the same. Wonder what happened. Had to be the storm. They sh should have known better, though. They, they have satellite talkies for those ships. Big eyes on the clouds. They should never get hit. Miss Pima's learned turn to take a look at Naylor. How do you know? You remember old Miles? Didn't he die? Yeah. Some kind of infection got into his lungs. He used to work a got. He used to work galley on clipper ship though, before he got thrown off. He knew all kinds of stuff about Clipper's works. Told me they got holes made of special fiber so they slide through the water like oil. And they use computers to keep level. Measure water speed and wind. He definitely told me they talk to the weather satellites just like Lawson and Carlson do for when there's a storm coming. Maybe they thought they could outrun the storm, Pima guessed. Both of them stared at the wreckage. That's a lot of scavenge, Naylor said. Yeah, Pima paused. You remember what I said a couple nights ago? About needing to be lucky and smart. Yeah. How long do you think we can keep this a secret? She jerked her head back to the beach and the ship breaking yards from all of them. Maybe a day or two, Naylor guessed. If we're really lucky... Then someone comes out, fishing boat or a trader will spot it, even if the beach rats don't. Hailer's, Pima's lips compressed. We ought to claim this for us. Fat chance, Naylor studied the broken ship. No way we can defend a claim like this. Patrols will be looking for it. Corporate goons, Lawson and Carlson will want a piece, if it's full of salvage. It's salvage, all right, Pima interrupted. Look at it. It's never going to move again. 
Naylor shook his head stubbornly. I still don't see how we can keep it to ourselves. My mom, Pima suggested. She could help. She's got heavy crew. If she just appears to come down and work on it, people will notice. Naylor glanced back towards the beach. If we aren't back for light crew tomorrow, people are going to wonder where we are, too. He massaged his aching shoulder. We need goons. And even if we got thug muscle, as soon as they know about the ship, they take it for themselves, too. He matured her lip, thoughtful. I don't even know how to register scavenge. Trust me, no one's going to let us register this. What about Lucky Strike? He got contacts with the bosses. Maybe he could help us do it. Keep Lars and Carson off us. And he'd take it away from us too, just like everyone else. He's giving out food right now, Pima pointed out. No one else is doing that. Advances for everyone who can bring two friends to vouch. They're good for it once work gears up again. They're just lice biters. We're just lice biters to him. He doesn't need rust from us. Food's one thing. Naylor, Naylor stared at the wreck in frustration. So much wealth. If only they could lock it down. This is stupid. We're just weighing... We're just weighing copper in the ducks. We have no idea what's on board. Let's go in and see what we're talking about. Yeah, he must shook her head. You're right. Maybe there's something good in light we can hide. Then we'll decide about the rest. Yeah, maybe there'd be a reward for the ship if we report it. Reward? Nella shrugged. Heard about it on the radio play once at Chin's Noodle Shack. You get a bounty for helping someone out. Why don't you just call it bounty then? Naylor made a face. They called it a reward. He spat. Come on, let's check it out. They made their way over the last rocks to the ship. At low tide, the hole was surrounded by ankle deep water. A few fish sat in pools, others lay beached on the sand, rotting with the streamers of seaweed. Up close, the ship got bigger. Not like the rusting monoliths of the accelerated age, but still. It loomed over them. Pima clambered up the up the shattered edge of the clipper and slipped inside, her hands fast and accomplished from years on wrecking crews. Naylor followed, more slowly, hoisting himself on board with his one good hand. The ship was on its side, so crawling through its passages was a bit like being in the ducks, an unexpected familiarity to something that should have been so different. Naylor scanned the wreckage, glints of metal, bits of people's clothes strewn all around, all kinds of junk. The stink of rotting fish. Swank stuff, he said. He fingered a gown that looked like it was like it was silk. Look at this clothing. He even made a face of dismissal. Who needs clothes like that? She clambered out of the hole and up onto the cant of the upper deck. Scrambling, scrabbling along until she found a hatch access. A minute later, she called. I found the galley, then whistled. Come look at this. Naylor struggled up to join her. The galley was trashed, all fallen out, but many of the bins of food were still locked in place. Rice and flour in sealed containers. Pima stared. Pima started unlatching drawers. Bottles spilled out in, in a rain of broken glass and puffs of spices. She wrinkled her nose and coughed. Naylor sneezed. Slow down, crew girl. Sorry, she coughed again. Opened a locker. Meat spilled out. Spoiled already in the heat. Big, floppy steaks, better than anything they could get anywhere on the beaches. They both put their hands over their mouths, breathing shallowly as the stink enveloped them. I think they had electric cooling in here, Naylor said. It's the only way they would have kept all this meat. Damn, they had it good, huh? Yeah. No wonder old Miles was so sad he got kicked off. What did he do? He said he was drunk, but I think he was selling Red Rippers. Pima peered inside the locker, looking to see if anything was worth saving. Pulling her head out and gagging. 
The reek of the spoiled meat was so strong, was too strong. They kept going through the ship. They found the first body in one of the cabins. A shirtless man, his eyes still wide, crabs lurking in his guts. Pima turned away, gagging at the smell of death in, in the closed room, then peered in again. Fish flopped in a shallow pool beside the man's head. It was hard to tell if the man had drowned or if the ugly gash on his forehead had done him in, but he was dead. Well, you won't care if we scavenge, Pima muttered. You going to scavenge him? The other asked. He's got pockets. The other shook his head. I'm not touching them. Don't be a lice biter. Pima, sh Pima took a breath and crept close to the dead man. Flies exploded in a cloud, blood buzzing in the, in the warmth of the room. Pima tugged at the man's pants, ran her fingers through his pockets. She was acting tough, but Naylor could tell she was unnerved. They'd both heard stories of fresh scavenge. Bodies came with the territory, but it was still scary to look into a dead man's eyes and think that he'd been walking in the decks only a little while earlier, before the storm took it all away and gave it to a couple kids on the shoreline. Naylor scanned the rest of the, of the cabin. It was big. A cracked photo on the floor showed the man wearing a white jacket with stripes on his sleeves. Naylor picked up the peach, picture and studied it. I think this was a ship. Yeah. Naylor scanned the walls. There was an old-style spyglass secured with brackets. Pieces of paper with all sorts of writing on it. Seals and official-looking stamps. And... Then this picture of the man with the braid on his shoulder. And then this picture of the man with the braid on his shoulder and him standing in front of the clipper ship, smiling. Naylor couldn't tell if it was the same ship as the wreck or not, but it was obvious the man was full of pride. Naylor glanced over at the bloated, torn open corpse and blew out his breath, thoughtful. As if sensing his thoughts, Pima looked up from her work. It's all luck, Naylor. Just luck in the fates. It's all we got. She flashed scavenged coins at him meaningfully. It was enough money to feed them for a week. Copper coins and a damp wad of Chinese red paper cash. Today, we're the lucky ones. Yeah, Naylor nodded. And tomorrow, maybe we're not. The captain hadn't been so lucky, and now Naylor and Pima were flush because of it. Weird to think about it. The captain lay bloated, his face puffed and purpled. The sun, baking and ruining his flesh, flies buzz easy around his face, his lips and eyes, the blood on his head, the tear in his stomach. Whole clouds settled back on him as soon as Pima stepped away. Naylor studied the cabin again, thoughtful. Brass on the walls, all kinds of scavenge. It was a swank boat, for sure. The captain's cabin was rich, and even though the ship was large as a cargo ship, it didn't look like a working vessel. Everything seemed too nice. All silk and carpeted corridors, and brass and copper, and little glass lanterns. He and Pima kept going through cabins. They found carved furniture, sitting rooms, lounges, a bar with shattered liquor bottles, state rooms, art on the walls, mangled and torn, oil paintings tossed about and punctured. Down below in the engineering rooms where me mechanical systems controlled the ships, they found more bodies. Halfmen, Pima whispered, whispered. A trio of them bloated and drowned. Their bestial faces looked weirdly hungry with the long tongues hanging out of their sharp tooth mouths. Yellow dog eyes stared dead at Pima and Naylor, gleaming dully in the tropical sunbeams that penetrated the torn room. These people must have been damn swank if they could afford all these half men. That one looks like you, Naylor commented. You sure you don't you sure you haven't been selling eggs? Pima snorted with laughter and, and jabbed an elbow into his ribs. But even she didn't suggest scavenging them. There was something just too creepy about the genetically designed creatures to consider getting close to them. Naylor and Pima split up and continued to explore the ship. P 
Pima found another dead half-man in the upper decks, strapped to the wheel and drowned. So much death, Taylor thought. The people must have been complete idiots to get caught in a city killer. He shoved open a door and, whis and whistled, low and surprised. A table, tilted onto its side, crammed against the wall. Dark black wood, as deep as night. Shattered glass everywhere. Goblets thrown about. Pima, check this out! She came running. The room was loaded with silver. Silver candlesticks, silver tableware, silver platters, silver bowls. A huge lucky strike. All for the taking. That's a lot of scavenge, Pima gasped. That's enough to pay off our work debts. With that much, ca much cash, you could set up scavenge on your own, even by Bappy's light crew slot. Come on, Pima said. Let's clear it out before anyone else shows up. We are rich, lucky boy. She grabbed him and kissed him right, left, full horn on the lips, laughing his, at his surprised expression. Oh, lucky boy, we're rich. We're going to be bigger than Lucky Strike. Infected by her spirit, Nilla started to laugh, too. They gathered up the silver to them, mounting it around, piling it high. They picked through the shattered china, broken goblets, and half moons of delicate steamed glassware under unearthing more and more wealth. Pima went to find something to to hold it all. She returned with the hemp sack returned with hemp sacking that they could have called scavenge just a few minutes ago. Could have sold off the couple copper lengths that and would have called it a good day. And now it was just something to hold the real treasure. All that silver. Serving trays and forks and knives went into the sack. Forks so small they disappeared in Naylor's hands. Spoons so big and deep that they could have been used as ladles at Chen's scrub shack. Where he served a hundred head at a time. Naylor straightened. I'm going to see what else there is. There might be more like this. Pima grunted acknowledgement. Nammer clambered back onto the main passage and made his way past the sitting room, full of fallen paintings and scattered stationery. Even with a full light crew, it would take them several days to strip the clipper of all the brass and copper wiring. Once he and Pima took the first scavenge off, They'd have to come up with a plan. There had to be some way to get a share of the rest. Lucky and smart. They needed to be lucky and smart. The problem was, this lucky strike was almost too big to be smart about. He found another cavern door and kicked it open. An odd room full of dolls and waterlogged stuffed bears. Gleaming wooden trains built like little maglevs. A torn painting hung on the wall. A clipper ship, maybe even this one, painted from high up. Looking down on the deck, all the faces below were looking up, staring into the heights. The artist was pretty good. The painting, almost like a photograph. Looking into it gave Naylor a spooking feeling, as if he were about to fall into the painting and onto the deck of that ship. Landing on all these, all those people with their swank clothes and cool eyes staring up at him. It was dizzying. He turned away from the image and scanned the cabin again. On the far side of the room, there was another door. He crawled along the wall, and now a floor was half. And was now he crawled along the wall that was now a floor and hefted the door open. A bedroom. Coverlets everywhere. A huge shattered bed. And a beautiful girl, dead in a mangle, staring at him with wide black eyes. Naylor sucked in his breath. Even bruised and dead, she was pretty. Pinned under the pile of her bed, and the weight of all that stuff that had crushed her. Her black hair strung across her face like a wet net. Wide, dark eyes stared. Her blouse was torn and soaked, the fabric com a complex weave of color and silvery threads. She was young. Not like the captain and the half men, maybe Pima's age. A rich girl, with a diamond pierced nose. He would have envied her if she wasn't so dead. He called out to Pima, Found another debtor. Another half man? Pima called back. 
Mueller didn't answer. Didn't take his eyes off the dead girl. Scrambling sounds came from behind, and then Pima appeared. Damn, she said. Too bad. Pretty, huh? Pima laughed. Didn't know you liked corpses. Naylor made a face of disgust. If I want a girl, there's plenty of live ones, thanks. Pima grinned. But this one won't slap you like... Yeah, but this one won't slap you like Moon Girl did when you tried to kiss her. Lips took... Lips look a little cold, though. Kiss that one and she'd take you down to the scavenge gods. Fails for sure. Ugh. Naylor made a face. Pima spent too much time around heavy crews. It gave her a harsh edge sense of humor. She's got gold on her, Pima said. Miller had been looking at the girl's black eyes, but Pima was right. Gold around her slender brown, brown throat. Gold on her fingers, if it was real. It was a fortune, worth more than anything they'd found so far. As one, he and Pima crawled across the wreckage to the broken body. The girl's corpse was buried under furniture. None of it had even been secured, as if the rich swanks thought a storm wouldn't dare rearrange their furniture. As if they were gods and didn't just predict the weather with their instruments and satellites, but also told it what to do. Naylor shivered at the sight of the broken rich girl. There were lessons there, as powerful as the ones Pima's mother taught when she explained how they, how they were to survive into adulthood. Pride and death just came, pride and death came just as fast as whether you were Bappy, thinking you were the boss of the light crew forever, or whether you were just this shattered girl with her fine toys and fine clothes and pretty golden jewels. They crouched beside the body. At least there's no crabs, Pima muttered. She took the girl's necklace and yanked. The girl's head jer jerked back like a marionette's and the chain parted. The golden pennant swung before them, mesmerizing, wo mesmerizing wealth in Pima's fist. One quick grab and they were richer than anyone, except maybe Lucky Strike. They both started working on the, on the dead girl's rings, tugging them from the cool flesh, trying to get them off. Damn, Naylor muttered, tugging harder. Her fingers got all stiff. You're stuck too, Pima asked. They're all fat and waterlogged. None of these rings come off. Pima drew her work knife. Here. Naylor made a face of disgust. You're just going to chop her fingers off. No worse than cutting the head off a chicken. And look, at least she's not going to squawk and flap around. Pima set the knife against the girl's finger. Do it with me. Where do I cut? On the joint, Pima indicated. You can't cut through the bone. This way, they just pop right off. Naylor shrugged and got out his own knife. He set it against the joint where it would part easily. He pressed his blade into the girl's flesh, and blood welled up where he cut. The girl's eye, black eyes blinked. Okay, another break. This time, I'm going to try not to spill all over myself. So, how's everyone enjoying so far? Hey, Ren, you still there? How about the folks in, uh, in chat? And, uh, Ren, if you are talking, I think you're still on push to talk. Hey, Atro, how you doing? Sorry, right as you decided to stop, I got a spam phone call. Somebody trying to sell oh. me. Trying to sell me hotels. It was like, um, and I love when they say, "Don't worry, this is not a sales call." It's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You you've been selected to win. It's like, hmm. I don't stay at Embassy Suites first of all, and second of all. Uh. Every time they start, I close it immediately, and I put them on block. Yeah, and basically that was what I did. It's like I didn't even acknowledge them. It was like, I let them talk for a minute, and then I just hung up. <laughs> like, it's clear. You're selling something. You're reading from a cue card. 
Yeah. Ah, uh, bummer, Golden. Well, um... So if you want to catch... And hello, Alex. Yeah. There. Yeah, if you want to catch the rest, um, I'm probably going to be reading for a little bit longer. Um, this should be posted on uh, Party by Gaming Twitch slash Party by Games. It'll be posted on the channel. Yes, you can find it on the channel. You can backlogs. It is there. Uh, yep. Here we go. <laughs> Blood and rust. Nail her left back. She's not a dead or she's alive. What? Pima scram scrambled away from the girl. Her eyes held him. Nailer's heart hammered in his chest. He felt the urge to bolt from the cabin. The girl lay still now, but his skin was crawling. He cut her and she moved. I didn't see. Pima stopped mid-sentence. The drowned girl's dark eyes focused on her. They went from Pima to Nailer and back to Pima. Fates, Nailer whispered. Cold fingers ran up his spine, raising hackles. Hackles. It was like their knives had summoned her ghost back into her body. The dead girl's lips started to move. Mm. No words came out. Just a barely audible hiss. That's some creepy shit, Pima muttered. The girl continued whispering. A steady stream of... A steady stream of sibilance, a chant, a plea, all so low they could barely make out the words. Against his better judgment, Naylor crept forward, drawn by her eyes in desperation. The girl's gold-decorated fingers twitch, reached for him. Pima came up behind. The girl strained toward the girl strained towards them, but. They both swayed out of her, but they both swayed out of her grasp. More whispered words. Prayer sounds, begging. An exhalation of storm and salt terror and of storm and salt terror. Her eyes searched the cabin, widened in fear, so terrified by something only she could see. Her gaze locked on Naylor again, desperate, pleading. Still she whispered. He leaned closer, straining to understand her words. The girl's hands fluttered weakly against his arms, reached up to touch his face. A movement light as butterflies as she, as she tried to pull him close. He leaned in, letting the drowned girl's fingers clutch at him. Her whispering lips brushed his ear. She was praying. Soft, begging words to Ganesha and the Buddha to Callie Mary, Mercy, and the Christian God. She was praying to anything at all, begging the fates to let her walk from the shadow of death. Please spilled from her lips a desperate trickle. She was broken, soon to die, but still the words slipped out in a steady whisper. Tum karuna kishagar tum palan Cat, a uh, hell, Mary, full of grace. Ajan, shan, bodhisattva, release me from the suffering. He drew away. His fingers slipped from her fingers slipped from his cheek like orchid petals falling. She's dying, Pima said. The girl's eyes had become unfocused. Her lips still moved, but she seemed to be losing energy now, losing her will to pray. The words were a quiet punctuation to the larger sounds of the ocean and coast outside gulls calling. The surf, the creak of and shift of the wrecked ship. 
Gradually, the words stopped, her body stilled. Pima and Naylor exchanged glances. The gold on the girl's fingers glittered. Pima lifted her knife. Fates, that's creepy. Let's get the gold and get out the hell out of here. You're going to cut her fingers off while she's still breathing. She's not breathing for long, Pima pointed at the, at the bed and sea chests and debris piled on top of her. She's a goner. If I slit her throat, I'm doing her a favor. She crept, she crept close and prodded the girl's hand. The drowned girl didn't respond. She's dead now anyway. Pima pressed the knife to the girl's finger again. The girl's eyes snapped open. Please, she whispered. Pima pressed her lips together, ignoring the words. The girl's free hand brushed at Pima's face, and Pima swatted it away. Pima leaned on the knife, and blood welled up. The girl didn't flinch, didn't pull away, just watched, black eyes begging as the knife cut into her brown skin. Please, she said again. Naylor's skin crawled. Don't do it, Pima. Pima glanced up at him. You're going to get squeamish on me. You think you're going to save her? Be her white knight? Like mom's kitty stories? You're just a beach rat. She's a swank. She gets out of here, the ship's hers, and we lose everything. We don't know that. Don't be stupid. This is only scavenge if she's not around. If she's not standing on it. This is only scavenge if she's not standing on it, saying it's hers. All that silver we found, all this gold on her fingers, you know this boat's hers. You know it. Look at the room she's in. Pima waved a hand at the wreckage around them. She's no servant, that's for sure. She's a damn swank. We let her out, we lose everything. She looked at the girl. Sorry, swank. You're worth more dead than alive. She glanced at Naylor. If it... If it makes you feel better, I'll put her down first. She moved the knife to the girl's smooth brown, brown throat. The girl's eyes went to him, starving for salvation, but she didn't speak again, only stared. Don't, don't cut her, Naylor said. You can't make a lucky strike like this. It would be like Sloth was with me. It's not the same at all. Sloth was crew. Was crew. She swore blood oath with you. She didn't have morals. But this swank? Pima tapped the drowned girl with her knife. She's not crew. She's just a boss girl with a lot of gold. She made a face. If we pick stick her, we're rich. No more crew for life. Right? The gold glittered on the girl's fingers. Naylor struggled with his conflicting emotions. It was more wealth than he... Whoops, skipped a page. It was more wealth than he had ever seen. More wealth than most of the crews collected in years off of the ships. And yet, it decorated this girl's fingers as casually as Moon Girl pierced her lips with steel. Pima pressed her case. This is once in a lifetime, Naylor. We play it smart, we're screwed for life. She was shaking, and a glitter of tears showed in her eyes. I don't like it either. She looked down at the girl. It's not personal. It's just her or us. Maybe she'll give us a roar for saving her, he said. We both know that's not the way it works, Pima looked at him sadly. That's for fairy tales and Pearlie's mom stories, and about the Raja who falls in love with his servant girl. We either get rich, or we die on heavy crew. If we're lucky, maybe we'll walk oil scavenge until our legs get sores and our dads beat your head in. And your dead beat your head in. What else? The harvesters? The nail sheds? We could always run run red rippers and crystal slide out to the wrecks until Carl, Lawson and Carl, Carlson sting, string us up. That's what we get. And Swanky here? She goes right back to her rich girl life. Pima paused. Or we get out. With this gold. We get out for good. Naylor stared at the girl. A few days ago, he would have cut her. He would, he would have apologized to those desperate eyes and put a knife in her neck. He would have made it fast. He would have made it a fast kill, so she wouldn't suffer. He wouldn't hurt her the way his dad liked to hurt people. But still, he would have cut her dead, 
and then he would have stripped the gold off her waterlogged corpse and walked away. He would have felt sorry for sure, and even have to put an offering on the scavenge god scale to help get her to whatever afterlife she believed in. But she would have been dead, and he would have had called himself. Now, though, the dark reek of the oil room filled his mind. The memory of being up to his neck in warm death, staring up at Asloth high above him. Her little LED paint mark glowing. Salvation, if only he could convince her. If only he could reach out and touch that part of her that cared for something other than herself. Knowing that there was a lever inside her somewhere, and if he could pull it, she would go for help, and he would be saved, and everything would be fine. He'd been so desperate to get Sloth to care. But he hadn't been able to find the lever. Or maybe the lever hadn't been there at all. Some people couldn't see any farther than themselves. People like Sloth. People like his dad. Richard Lopez wouldn't hesitate. He slashed the rich girl's throat, take the rings, shake the blood off, and then laugh. A week ago, Naylor knew for a fact that he could have done the same. This swank girl wasn't crew. He didn't owe her anything. But now, after his time in the oil room, all he could think of was how much he wanted Sloth to believe that his life was just as important as hers. The gold on the drowned girl's fingers glittered. What was wrong with him? Naylor wanted to punch a wall. Why couldn't he just be smart? Why couldn't he just crew up and cut the girl and take the scavenge? Naylor could almost hear his father laughing at him, mocking him for his stupidity. But Naylor stared into the, the drowned girl's pleading eyes. They might as well have been his own. I'm sorry, Pima, he said. Can't do it. We got to help her. Pima slumped. You sure? Yeah. Hell. Pima wiped her eyes. I should, I should pig stick her anyway. You thank me later. Don't. Please. You both know it's not right. Right? What's right? Look at all that gold. Don't, don't cut her throat. Pima grimaced, but she withdrew her knife. Maybe she'll let us keep the silverware. Yeah, maybe. Already he was regretting the choice, watching his hope, watching his hopes for a different future fall away. Tomorrow he and Pima would be ship breaking in, and this girl would either live and walk away, or she'd alert the rest of the Bright Sands ship breakers to the scavenge. And either way, he was out of luck. He'd been lucky, and now he was throwing it away. I'm sorry, he said again. And he wasn't sure if it was Pima he was sorry for himself, or the girl who blinked at him with wide black eyes. And who, if he was very lucky indeed, might not make it through the night. I'm sorry. Tide's coming in, Pima. Pima said. If you're going to be a hero rescuer, you better do it quick. Okay. Another drink. Stay hydrated, everyone. Stay hydrated. There we go. The girl was stuck under all sorts of junk. A wealth of sea chests and the big four-poster bed. It took them almost an hour to pull all the stuff free. The girl didn't say anything more as they worked. Once she gasped as they shifted a chest off her. And Naylor worried that they'd perhaps crushed her in the shifting wreckage. But when they finally pulled her body free, soaked and shivering in the failing light, she seemed whole. Her skin was bloody and her clothes were torn and sopping, but she was alive. Excuse me. Pima inspected her body. Damn, Naylor. She's almost as lucky as you. And then she made a face of disgust when she realized that with Naylor's bad arm, Pima was going to be doing the rescuing after all. 
She's not going to kiss you or thank you if you don't crew up, she smirked. Shut up, Naylor muttered. But he was suddenly aware of the girl's slim form under her wet clothes, the curve of her body, the flash of a thigh and, and throat that showed in the torn fabric of her skirt and blouse. Puma just laughed. She levered the drowned girl out of the cabin and down through the canted corridors of the ship until they spilled out of the hole, hole into the hole. The girl was heavy, barely able to walk or help in any way. She might as well have been a corpse, Pima commented as she grunted and dragged the girl out. It took both of them to lower her over the side and into the lapping waters of the tide. Naylor awkwardly holding her and lowering it down into Pima's outstretched arms, and then both of them staggering and stumbling into the increasing surf. Get the damn silver, Pima grunted. At least get that sack off. If anyone else finds the ship, we want that hidden. Naylor clambered back into the ship, collecting. When he stood again at the edge of the hull's cracked hollow, Pima was standing alone in the water foam up to her thighs. For a moment, he thought she'd drowned the girl, but then saw a flash of pale clothing on the rocks at the base of the island. Pima grinned. He thought I picked stuck her, didn't you? No. Pima just laughed. Waves sloshed around her, splashing up her dark legs and soaking her shorts. The ship creaked in the roll of the waves. Tide's coming, Pima said. Let's get going. Naylor looked across the bay to where the ship-breaking yard shone in the fading sun. We're never going to get her back over the sand in time. You want me to run for a boat? Pima asked. No. I'm beat. Let's hold her here on the island and cross in the morning. Maybe we can think of some way to deal with the rest of the scavenge by then. Pima glanced back at the girl, where she lay balled up and shivering. Yeah. Okay. She won't care one way or the other. She pointed back to the ship. But if we're staying, let's find what we can in there. There's food, plenty of other stuff. We'll camp on the island and bring her over tomorrow. Naylor gave her a mock salute. Good idea. He headed back into the pantry, hunting. He found muffins, waterlogged with salt, bruised mangoes and bananas and pomegranates all scattered through the galley. Salt beef that was still good and seemed like they had barely been touched, a cured ham. There was so much meat, he couldn't believe it. Against his will, he was already salivating. He dragged everything back to where the hole was cracked and climbed carefully, climbed down carefully, cradling everything in a net bag he had found. In the, the water was getting deeper, all right. It tugged and drew at him as he slogged out of the surf, keeping the food high. After ferrying everything from the ship, he noticed their rescued girl shivering, and went back to the ship again. It was almost dark inside now. He found him, found blankets of rich wool, damp but still warm, and dragged them out with the rest of the scavenge. He crossed with he crossed with waves at the at his waist, yanked about by frothing surf, holding the blankets over his head. He stumbled up the shore and dumped his lo load of blankets. He glanced at where the girl was shivering. You still didn't kill her, huh? Told you I wouldn't. Pima jerked her head towards the shivering girl. You got stuff for a fire? Naylor shrugged. Nah. Come on, Naylor. Pima made a face of exasperation. You should need a fire if you want her to live. She headed back into the wreck, slogging through the rush and the darkening waves. See if there's fresh water in there, too, Naylor called after her. He picked up the load of blankets and started hauling them to higher ground, hunting for something on the hillside that had the semblance of being flat. Eventually, he found an area beside the roots of a cypress tree that wasn't so bad. He started clearing space amongst the rocks and coots of vines. By the time he clambered down onto the shore, Hema had returned with a load of clippers wrecked furniture. She had also found a store of kerosene and a sparker in the mix of trash in the galley. After a few more times, shuttling loads of food and fuel up to the camp, they finally hauled up the drowned girl. 
Naylor's right shoulder and upper back burned with all the activity. And he was glad he hadn't been forced into light crew today. It was still, it was bad enough just doing this little bit of work. Soon, they got the furniture bear burning merrily, and Naylor cut slices of hams for them to gnaw on. Good eating, huh? He said when Pima held out her hand for more. Yeah, swings live pretty damn good. We're pretty swank ourselves, Naylor pointed out. He waved at the scavenged wealth around them. We're eating better than Lucky Strike tonight. As soon as he said it, he thought it would be true. He thought it could be true. The fire flickered before him, casting light on Puma and the drowned girl, illuminating the bags of food and the sack of silver and tableware. The thick wool blankets of the of the north, the gold glittering on the drowned girl's finger, shining like stars in the cackle of the fire campfire. It was more than anyone in the shipbreaking yards had, and all of it was just wreckage for the drowned girl. Her wealth was huge. A ship full of food and luxury, her neck and fingers and wrists draped in gold and jewels, and a face more beautiful than anything he had ever seen. Not even Bappy's, Bappy's magazine girls had been so pretty. She's damn rich, he muttered, looking at everything Look at everything she's got. It's more than even the magazines have. In fact, he was realizing that the magazine pictures were pretending to reach this level of wealth, and yet somehow had no idea how to attain it. I think she's got a house of her own, he asked. He even made a face. Of course she's got a house of her own. All rich people have houses. Think it's as big as her ship? Pima hesitated, working over the thought. I guess it could be. Naylor chewed his lip, considering how... Considering considering their own rough shelters on the beach. Squats made of branches and scavenged planks and palm leaves that blew away like trash whenever storms came. The fire warmed and dried them, and they were silent for a long time, watching as the furniture of the ship cackled and burned. Check it out, Pima said suddenly. The girl's eyes, closed for a long time, were now open, watching the fire. Pima and Naylor studied the girl. The girl studied them in turn. You're awake, huh? Naylor said. The girl didn't respond. Her eyes watched them, silent as a child. Her lips didn't move. She didn't pray. She didn't say anything. She blinked, staring at him. But still, she said nothing. Pima knelt down beside her. You want some water? You thirsty? The girl's eyes went to her, but she remained silent. You think she's gone crazy? Naylor asked. Pima shook her head. Hell if I know. She took a small silver cup and poured water into it. She held it before the girl, watching. You thirsty? Huh? You want some water? The girl made a weak motion and strained towards the cup. Hema brought the water to her lips, and she sipped awkwardly. The girl's eyes were more focused, watching both of them. Pima tried to give her more water, but she turned her face away and made to sit up instead. When she had pushed herself completely upright, she drew her limbs and were curling her arms around her legs. The firelight flickered orange and bright on her face. He went off of the water again, and this time the girl drank fully, finishing it and eyeing the jug wistfully. Give her more, Naylor said, and again the girl drank. This time, taking the cup in her own shaking hand, water spilled down her chin as she drank greedily. Hey, Huma grabbed the cup back. Watch it. That's all the water we've got tonight. She gave the, she gave the girl a look of annoyance then turned and rifled through the sack of fruit that Naylor had gathered. She came up with an orange she sliced into wedges and offered to the girl. The girl took a wedge and ate greedily and accepted another. She was almost feral in her fascination as she, as she watched Pima slice chunks from the orange, but after a few bites, she lay down again, seeming to fold onto the ground with exhaustion. She smiled weakly and murmured, Thank you. 
And then her eyes closed and she went silent. Pima pursed her lips. She got up, pulled the blanket more fully over the girl's still form. Guess we got a live one, Naylor. Guess so. Naylor didn't know if he was relieved or saddened by the girl's survival. She lay peaceful now, eyes closed, breathing deeply, asleep it seemed. If she had died or had been crazy, it would have been so much easier. I sure hope you know what you're doing, Pima murmured. <sighs> More drink. Uh, is Golden still with us? They might have already gone to bed. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, it looks like they fell off. Uh, Kelsa's in here, though. Hello, Kelsa. I see you. Hey, Kelsa. Um, do you just so you like joined. when? You... Yeah. Have you have you been enjoying the story? Need more drink. She's only been here a short while. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we are reading Shipbreaker. Uh, they just rescued a swank girl, and I love that they call them swanks. She's she's so swanky. Yeah. Um, so do we have, do we have Golden following us now, or? Yeah, they're my follower. Oh, okay. Well, because they mentioned something about their own following. Yeah, I didn't quite get that, but I followed them, because apparently they're a streamer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kelsa, it's, um, set in the same world as, uh, my favorite book. Mm -hmm which I've opted not to start with because one, I don't have it with me because I let my sister borrow it. And two, because it's a lot darker and has much larger vocabulary than I am usually used to dealing with um, to the point where I had to keep a dictionary beside me for the first half of the book or first quarter anyway. Um, it's a pretty good book. I like the author. Um, he's pretty good at, at writing these stories, but yeah. Post-apocalyptic, semi. Like I, I don't know how to how to like consider like the whole dystopian um, deal because you never you only because in the in the in my favorite in the wind up girl it's you only meet like one person from these. Anywho, oh yeah, that was that was that was really dark. I did like the ending though; very satisfying, even if not what you expect. Um, it's pretty good. It's it's definitely not as as um, graphic, I guess I should say, um, but. Um, uh, I like it. Um, one of my favorite characters. Well, my first, my favorite character is Pima's mom, just because she's a badass. And then I also like, uh, I like the uh, the dog man, uh, Tool, who's not really part of the story yet, but he'll get here. Uh, let's see. Here we are. If he was honest with himself, Naylor could admit he had no idea what he was doing. He was making it up as he went along. Some new version of a future, and all he really knew was that this strange swank girl needed to be part of it. This rich girl with her diamond no nose jewel and her gold rings and fingers all intact. With her dark glittering eyes alive instead of dead. 
He sat on the far side of their furniture, arms wrapped around his knees as he watched Pima give give her the rest of the orange. Two girls, two different lives. Pima dark, strong and scarred, tattooed with light crew information and lucky symbols crop and lucky symbols. Cropped hair, crop haired, hard muscled, and sharply alive. This other one, a far lighter brown, untouched by the sun, with long, black flowing hair and Movements all smooth and soft, polished and precise. Her face and bare arms unmarred by abuse or stray wiring or chemical burns. Two girls, two different lives, two different bits of luck. Naylor tugged his wide board earrings. He and Pima both had their share of marks. Everything from tattoos that let them work on the cruise to their own carefully worked ink skin scars, showing blessings of the rust saint and fates. But this girl wasn't marked at all. No decorative tattoos, no work marks, no light gang tats, nothing. A blank. He was a little shorter than her, but he knew he could kill her if he had to. He couldn't beat Pima in a fight, but this one, she was soft. Why didn't you kill me? Naylor startled. The girl's eyes were open again, watching him across the fire, reflecting the blaze of shattered ship furniture and picture frames. Why didn't you kill me when you had the chance? She whispered. Her words were cultured, exquisite in her mouth. Clipped and close and precise, as if she were one of the boss men who came down to watch and watched the work and paid out cash bonuses for good salvage. Perfectly formed words, with not a break in them. Not a hard edge. She accepted the last of the orange slices from Hima and ate them. Taking her time and seeming to savor them, slowly she pushed herself upright again. Her eyes went from Naylor to Pima. You could have just let me die. She wiped the corner of her mouth with the palm of her hand, licking at the last of the orange juice. I couldn't get out. You could have been rich with my gold. Why? Ask Lucky Boy, Pima said, disgusted. Wasn't my idea. The girl looked at him. You're called Lucky Boy. Naylor couldn't tell if it was an honest question or if she was making fun of him. He stifled his unease. Found your ex, didn't I? Her lips quirked. I guess that makes me a lucky girl then, doesn't it? Her eyes twinkled. Pima laughed, and she squatted beside her. Yeah, sure. Lucky girl. Damn lucky. For a moment, her eyes lingered hungrily on lucky girl's hands, on the gold glittering against her brown skin. Damn lucky. So why not take my gold and walk away? She held up her hand where the thin slivers of, uh, of their blades had cut. You could have had my fingers for fate's amulets, right? Could have had my gold and my finger bones, too. Her smooth features had hardened. She was clever, Naylor, Naylor realized. Soft, but not stupid. Naylor couldn't help thinking that he'd made a mistake letting her live. It was hard to tell when you were being smart and when you were being too smart for your own good. And this girl, she already seemed to be taking over the space around the fire, owning it, asking the questions instead of answering them. Lucky Strike always said that there was a fine line between clever and stupid and laughed his head off every time he said it. Watching this girl cross the fire, taunt and tease him, Naylor suddenly had the feeling that he understood. I think one of my fingers would have made a nice amulet for you, she said to him. Would have made you exquisitely lucky. Pima laughed again. Naylor scowled. Dozens of futures extended ahead of him, depending on his luck and the will of fates. And the variable that this girl presented, he could see those roads spinning away from him in different directions. He was standing at their hub, looking down each one of them in turn but he could see only so far. 
one or two steps ahead at best. And now he stared at the sharp eyes of this perfectly unblemished swank. He realized that he had missed a factor. He didn't know anything about the girl. He knew about he knew about gold, though. Gold bought security, salvation from the ships and the breaking and light crew. Lucky Strike had gone down that road. Naylor would have been smarter to simply let Pima Pig stick the girl and be done with it. But if there were other roads, but what if there were other roads? What if there was a reward for this rich girl? What if she could be useful in some other way? You got crew who come looking for you? He asked. Crew? Someone want, someone wants you to come home. Her eyes never lifted, never left his. Of course, she said. My father would be hunting for me. He rich? He asked. Swank like you? Miller shot her annoyed, her not shot her an annoyed glance. Amusement fate flickered across Lucky Girl's face. He'll pay if that's what you're asking. She held up her fingers. It'll pay you more than just my jewelry. She pulled a ring off and tossed it to Pima. Pima caught it, surprised. More than that. More than all the wealth I got on my ship. She looked She looked at them seriously. Alive, I'm more valuable than gold. Yale exchanged glances with Pima. This girl knew what they wanted. Knew them inside and out. It was as if she were a beach witch and could throw bones and see right into his soul. To all his hunger and greed, it pissed him off that he and Pima were so obvious. Made him feel like a little kid, stupid and obvious. The way the urchins looked when they were hanging out behind Chin's scrub shack, hoping he'd toss out bones for them to pick over. She just knew. How do we know you're not lying? Pima asked. Maybe you've got nothing else to give. Maybe you're just talking. The girl shrugged, unconcerned. She touched her remaining rings. I have houses where fifty servants wait for me to ring a bell and bring me whatever I want. I have two clippers and a dirigible. My servants wear uniforms of silver and jade, and I gift them with gold and diamond. And you can have it, too, if you help me reach my father. Maybe, Naylor shrugged. But maybe you, all you've got is some gold on your fingers. And you're better off dead. The girl leaned forward, her face lit by the fire. Her features suddenly cold. If you hurt me, my father will come here and wipe you and yours off the face of the earth and feed your guts to the dogs. She sat back. It's your choice. Get rich helping me or die poor. Screw it, Pima said. Let's just drown her and be done. A flash of uncertainty crossed the girl's face. So quick, Naylor, that... So quick, Naylor might have miss, missed it if he hadn't been watching closely. But he caught the slight widening of her eyes. You should watch yourself, he said. You're alone. No one knows where you are or what happened to you. You could be drowned in the ocean for all anyone knows. Maybe you just disappear, and the wind and the waves don't remember you even did. He grinned. You're a long way from your swank servants. No, the rich girl drew her blankets around her like a cloak and looked out to the moonlit ocean and the far waves. The GPS and distress systems in the ship will tell them where to look. It's only a matter of time now, she smiled. My crew will be coming very soon. But right now, you've only got me and Pima, Naylor said. And you definitely ain't our crew. He, le he, leaned, he leaned forward. Maybe your people really will hurt us bad. Yank out our guts, cut off our fingers. But that doesn't scare us, lucky girl. He drew out the, world, the words of the nickname, mocking. He waved back toward the ship, breaking yards. We die here every day die all the time. Maybe I'm dead tomorrow. Maybe I was dead two days ago. He spat. My life isn't worth a copper yard. He looked at her, 
So the only way your life is worth more than that gold on your fingers is if it gets us out of this place. Otherwise, you're just as good dead. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, he realized it was true. He was in hell. The shipbreaking yards were hell. And wherever this girl came from, whatever she was, it had to be better than anything else. Even Lucky Strike, who everyone thought lived like a king, was nothing in comparison to the spoiled, sleek girl. Fifty people answering to her. Lucky Strike could muster Raymond and Blue Eyes and Sammy Hugh. And that was enough for most his leg-breaking jobs, but it was nothing outside. And even Lucky Strike smiled and scraped. And scraped when the big bosses from Lawson and Carlson rolled in on their special train to inspect the breaking. Before it rolled out again to wherever Swings, Swanks lived, this girl was from a whole different planet. And she was going to back, and she was going back to it. If you want to stay alive, he said, you take us with you where, when you go. She nodded slowly. That's fair. She's lying, Pima said. Buy in time. That's all. Sh she's not our crew. As soon as her people show, she's gone, and we're back in the yards. She glanced back to where the invisible hulks of the wrecked ocean still lay along the beach. If we're lucky. That true, Naylor studied the swank carefully, trying to divine if she was a liar. Gonna ditch us? Dump us back with the rest of the shipbreakers while you go back to being a swank? I don't lie, the girl said. She didn't look away from his gaze. She held hard as obsidian. Naylor took out his knife. Let's see then. He came around the fire to her. She flinched away, but he grabbed her by the wrist. And even though she struggled, he was stronger. He held the knife in front of her eyes. Pima grabbed her by the shoulder, steadying her. Just a little blood, lucky girl. Just a little, she said. Just to make sure, right? The girl didn't stand a chance against Pima's strength. Naylor dragged her hand towards him. She fought all the way, jerking and twisting, but it was not. And soon he had her hand outstretched before him. He pressed the blade into her palm and looked up at her, smiling. You still swear now? He said, looking into her eyes. Are you going with you when we, when you go? The girl was breathing fast, scared and panic, and panicky. Her eyes going from blade to him and back again. I swear, she whispered. I swear. Still, he studied her face, hunting for signs that she'd betray them, that she'd pull a sloth and stab them in the back. He glanced at Pima. She nodded a go-ahead. Guess she wants it. Guess so. Naylor slashed her palm. Blood welled up in the girl's hand, spasm, fingers trembling at the gash. He was surprised she didn't scream. Naylor slashed his own hand and made a, and made a fist with hers. Crew up, lucky girl. I got your back. You got mine. He held her eyes with his own. He and jostled the girl. Say it. Lucky girl stuttered. But she, but she said the words, I got your back, you got mine. Naylor nodded, satisfied. Good. He pried open her bleeding hand and drove his thumb into, his, into the slash of her open wound. She gasped at this new pain and then, pressed his, and then pressed his thumb to her forehead. She flinched as he applied the bloody tattoo between her eyes, a third eye mark of shared destiny. She trembled and closed her eyes as, she, as he marked her. Now you mark him, Pima said. Blood with blood, lucky girl. That's how we do it. Blood with blood. Lucky girl did as she was told, her face frozen as she drove her own thumb into his palm and marked him as well. Good, Pima leaned close. Now me. <sighs> How's everyone doing? So much blood. Um, when I made uh, some of my uh, some of my characters, I did try to take some of the traits from 
uh, Lucky Girl when I designed them. When it was done, they went down to the bed, to the black water and rinsed the blood from their hands before hiking back up into the vegetation. The sea was all around, leaving the three of them alone in the darkness as they slowly climbed up onto the, to their beacon fire. Naylor's shoulder was tender and a plain from all the activity. Excuse me. And it made climbing difficult. Lucky girl scrambled ahead of them, loud in the vegetation. Unused to climbing, breathing heavily, her clothes torn, Naylor watched her slim legs in smooth form under her skirt. He must back him. What, you think you're getting with her? After you stuck a knife into her hand? He grinned and made a shrug of embarrassment. She damn pretty. Probably cleans up nice, Pima agreed. Then lowered her voice. What do you think? Is she really crew? Naylor paused in, in the climb, rotating his shoulder carefully, feeling the sear of his wound across his back. Being crew wasn't worth a scrap of rust with, with sloth. Crew don't mean anything except that we're all sweating together on the same ship. He shrugged and winced at the pain again. Still, it's worth a gamble, right? You serious about leaving here? Naylor nodded. Yeah. That's the smart thing, right? The real smart thing. Nothing here for us. We need to get out. We die the same as everyone else. Even Lucky Strike got trashed in the storm. Being light crew boss didn't do Bappy any good at all. Just got him killed. Lucky Strike did a lot better than us. Sure, Naylor spat. That's what the pig in the pen says when you when his brother gets knifed for dinner. He shrugged. You're still in the pen. Still gonna die. What? Time skip. Not really. Long rest. There we go. Naylor woke to sun pouring over him and the luxury of knowing that he still had another couple hours before the tide would be far enough out for them to make their way back to shore. By this time, on any regular day, he would have been on light crew. Deep in a duct with LED glow paint smeared on his forehead, like a luck mark, sucking dust and mouse droppings and sweating in the darkness. The sun shone down through the rust rustling of ferns and stunted cypress of the island and dappled light and shadow. Voices interrupted his thoughts. Now, don't, pull, don't put all the damn wood on at once. Do it slow. Pima's voice. Lucky girl said something in return that Naylor couldn't make out, but sounded like she wasn't much interested in Pima telling her what to do. He sat up and gasped with pain. His whole shoulder was on fire. A brutal pain that dug deep and burned like acid. He worked, to, he worked it too much yesterday, for sure. Too much effort, hunting scavenge and getting Lucky Girl out. And now he screwed it up again. He moved his arms gingerly, trying to get it to loosen up. The pain was intense. You awake? He looked up. Lucky Girl peering through the ferns. In the daylight, she was still pretty. Her light brown skin was smooth and clean, freshly scrubbed. She pulled her long black hair back and tied it in a knot so that it was out of her way, showing the delicate structure of her feet. She grinned at him. Pima wants to know if you're up. Yeah, I'm up. Get over your beauty sleep, Naylor, Pima called. It's breakfast time. Yeah, Naylor pushed himself upright and forced, and forced through the ferns to where the girls crouched around a newly built fire. Down on the water, the ship was still there. Shifted by the tide, but so tangled in the rocks that it hadn't fled down the coast. Luck was holding, he supposed, especially if they wanted Lucky Girl's people to find her quickly. He looked around for whatever they were eating. He didn't see anything prepared. What's for breakfast? he asked, puzzled. Whatever you make, Pima said. And she and Lucky Girl laughed. Ha ha, Naylor made a face. Seriously, what you got? 
don't look at me, Pima. Pima leaned back on the sandy ground. I made a fire. Naylor gave her another dirty look. You're not on light crew here. You're not bossing me, Pima laughed. Guess you're going to be damn hungry then. Naylor shook his head and started rifling sacks of food they pulled off the ship the night before. Don't be surprised when you find snot in yours. Pima sat up. You spit in my food, I spit in, fit in your mouth. Yeah, Naylor turned around. You want to try? Pima just laughed. You know I'd kick your ass, lucky boy. Just make breakfast and be glad we let you sleep. Lucky girl interceded. I'll help. Naylor shook his head. Don't worry about it. Pima doesn't cook because she screwed up. All muscle, no brains. He started pulling fruit from a sack, digging through the rest of it. Check it out, it. He pulled out a sack of grain. What is it? Pima sat up, interested. Wheat berries. They good? Pretty good. They chew better than rice. He paused, thoughtful. You swings half sugar? He asked, lucky girl. Down on the ship, she answered. Really? Naylor looked down to the water. He didn't want to have to climb all the way down and come back up. Can you get some sugar from fresh water? Lucky girl nodded, surprisingly eager. Sure. Naylor kept rifling through the food as Lucky Girl disappeared down the hillside. Man, I can't believe how much food they have. Regular feast every day, Pina said. Remember that pigeon Moon Girl brought for me as a luck gift? Good eating. Naylor jerked his head back towards Lucky Girl, scrambling into the ship. Bet she wouldn't think so. Is that why you want to leave with her? Naylor shrugged. Never really thought about it until last night. He trailed off trying to explain what was in his mind. You saw her cabinet, right? All the scavenge? It's nothing to her. And look at all her rings. Take that diamond out of her nose. And you or me? We are rich. But she doesn't even notice. Yeah, she's rich, all right. But she's not crew. No matter what you say, and I don't trust her. I asked her about her family, who they were. Pima shook her head. She ducked and dodged like Pearly when you ask him why he thinks he's Krish and he's Krishna. She's hiding stuff. Don't be fooled just because she looks so sweet. Yeah, she's smart. More than smart. Sly. You know all that gold on her fingers? Some of it's missing today. Don't know where she hid it. It's gone now. She's saying all kinds of things about us being crew, but she's running her own game too. Like we aren't. Don't blow me off, Naylor. You know what I mean. Naylor looked up at the tone in Pima's voice. I hear you, boss girl. We'll watch you close. Now let me cook. He found a sack of some kind of small dried red fruits and tasted one. They were tart and sweet in a mix. Pretty damn good. He tossed one to Pima. You know what this is? She tasted. Never had it. She held out her hand. Give me some more. He grinned. No way. I'm using them. You'll just have to wait. He set the sack out beside the wheat berries and, and stared at all the food. So casually, so casually kept in the ship. I never really thought about how bad it was here. Not until yesterday. Not until her. He paused. You got to think if she's that rich... There's other swings out there. There's money out there. And it ain't here. Even Lucky strikes a joke in comparison to what she's got. So you think you can just go live with her or something? Happily ever after. Don't make fun of me. You and the people in her crew are richer than Lucky Strike. If she's telling the truth. You know she is. And you know, if we stay here, we never get anything. Pima hesitated. You think we can take my mom? She asked. Is that what you're worrying about? Naylor smiled. We save the swank li Swank's life. She owes us big time. Blood debt. Of course we can take her. What about Moon Girl? Pearly? Rest of light crew? Naylor paused. Lucky Strike didn't share. He pointed out finally. He worked his own deal. Yeah. Pima didn't sound convinced, but her next words were interrupted by Lucky Girl scrambling back up into the greenery and vines. 
Got it, she panted, smiling. Nice, he grinned at Pima. She'd be good on light crew. When work starts up again, huh? Pima didn't smile. She'd, she'd sell pretty good to the nail sheds, too. She turned away. Lucky girl frown. What's wrong with her? Nothing, Miller said. She just gets moody when she's hungry. As he took the jar of water that Lucky Girl had carried up, he gasped. His shoulder was on fire. He almost dropped the water. Pima looked up. What's wrong with you? My back, Miller said through gritted teeth. It hurts like a snake bite. That means it's affected, Pima said. She hurried over. No, he shook his head. We cleaned it. Let me see. She pulled off the bandaging and sucked in her breath. Lucky girl took one look and gasped. What the hell did you do to yourself? Nayla craned his neck, craned his neck around, but he couldn't see. How bad is it? Lucky girl said. Lucky girl said, it's really infected. There's pus everywhere. She came closer, businesslike. Businesslike. Let me take a look. I'm trained in first aid from my school. Swanky, Nally, Nailer muttered, but Lucky Girl didn't respond. Her fingers probed and pressed against the wound. He flinched at the searing fire. You need antibiotics, she said. This smells awful. Pima shook her head. We don't have those here. What do you do when you're sick? Nailer grinned weakly. Let the fates decide. You're insane, Lucky Girl stared at his wound again. I should have something on the wind witch, she said. There's a whole lot of there's a whole medical closet. There ought to be some kind of cil some kind of cillin. Nailer shook her off. Let's eat first. Are you crazy? Lucky girl looked from from him to Pima. You don't wait on something like this. You take care of it now. Nailer shrugged. An hour later, what's the difference? Because it just gets worse and worse. Her face hardened. And then you die from it. This looks like you've got a super bacteria. We need to do something fast, or you're not going to make it. Without warning, Lucky Girl shoved her thumb into his back, into the heart of the wound. Nailer screamed and scrambled away. He clutched at his shoulder, gasping. The pain was so bad, he thought he'd black out. When he had himself under control, he yelled, What'd you do that for? Crew up, Nailer. Lucky Girl made a face. You can't collect a, a reward for saving me if you're dead. Let's get your ass down to my ship and get you fixed up. <laughs> Crew up, Pina laughed and hit Lucky Girl on the shoulder. Swank's starting to talk like us. She grinned again and then gave Naylor a serious look. She's got a point. Your mom would have been damn glad to have money for selling. You want to go out like she did? Sweating and sobbing, skin like fire. Her neck swollen with infection, eyes red and pus filled. Nayla shivered. Okay. You want to play doctor? Go for it. He snagged an orange as he started down the hillside. I'm not going out like she did, though. Won't happen. Despite his words, it was hard to get down to the water, and it was worried. His arm and shoulder and back were all on. Lucky girl and Puma guided him down, going slowly both of them helping, reaching out to support him like he was an old lady made sticks. As he made his way further down the hill, these girl, girl's words lingered, unwelcome, unwelcome. A reward wouldn't do him any good if he was dead. He forced down his rising fear, but it tickled at the back of his mind. He'd seen other people's wounds turn nasty, sick with rot and gangrene. Seen the stumps crawling with magnet, maggots where they'd gone bad after having an amputation. Despite his bravado, a trickle of fear ran strong. His mom had prayed to Callie Mary Mercy, Callie Mary Mercy, and she died in a haze of flies and fever pain. A superstitious part of Naylor wondered if the scavenge god was balancing the scales of his lucky strike with a sickness that would kill him before he could reap the reward. Sadna was right. He should have made more offerings to the scavenge god and the fates after he got out of the oil room. Instead, 
He just spit on that luck. They reached the ocean. The ship had rolled during the night, turning itself nearly upright. It made it harder for them to climb on board. Pima finally hauled Naylor up, groaning. Her muscles flexed as she dragged him up like a dead pig, then left him lying on the carbon fiber decking, while she and Lucky Girl went down below. When they finally came back, they were both shaking their heads. It's all broken up, Lucky Girl said. The ocean must have gotten it. She surveyed the wreckage of the ship. I don't see anything in the water. She shook her head again. It's all lost now. Naylor shrugged, making a show of nonchalance. When your people get here, they'll, they can get me the medicine. But even as he said it, he wondered how much time he had. He was shaking now, and even though he sat in the hot sun, he felt chilled. With your satellites, it won't be long, right? Yeah, sure. Lucky girl sounded uncertain. Pima nodded at the, uh, at the girl's jewelry. With your gold, we could buy medicine from Lucky Strike, no problem. Lucky girl looked up from her from her study of Nailer. This Lucky Strike has medicine? Sure, Pima nodded. He's crewed up with the boss men. Get some to bring things on the train. No, Nailer shook his head. We can't let anyone know about the wreck. We'll pull the scavenge. He shivered. We need to keep low until Lucky Girl's people show up. Then we can do whatever we want. We let people know, and they'll come after our scavenge with everything they've got. It's not your scavenge, Lucky Girl said Pearson. It's the Wind Witch, and it's my ship. Pima shook her head. Just direct now, and you're only alive because Naylor's nicer than most of our people. Had himself, had himself some kind of religious experience out there. Got the fever eye now, for sure. Naylor shook his head. I don't have fever eye. Pima shot him a glance. You don't think you're paying the price for all your luck? What's fever eye? Lucky girl asked. Pima stared at her. You don't know fever eye? She shook her head. Never heard of it. When dying people look into the, into the future, last look before the fates take them. I don't have fever eye, Naylor. Naylor felt tired. He sat heavily on the canted deck, perched in the sun. Maybe if I wash it, it'll make it better. Don't be stupid, Pima spat. Nothing's going to make that better except medicine. Naylor put his head on his arms. How long? Until your people come. Lucky girl shrugged. The GPS tracker will bring them soon, I think. You're that important. She seemed embarrassed. Pretty much. Who are your people, he asked. You're cagey about it. She hesitated. We're crew, Pima reminded her. My name's Shondhuri. Nita Shondhuri. They shrugged. Never heard the name. I have my mother's name until I inherit. She hesitated. My father's name is Patel. She waited expectantly. There was a pause. Then Pima said, Patel. Like Patel Global Transit, Pima and Naylor exchanged glances uh, as shock rolled over them. Your bosses, girl, Naylor asked. Pima's face turned furious. She lunged at, at Nita and shook her. You're one of those damn blood buyers. No! Patel Global buys all kinds of scavenge down here. Patel Global buys all kinds of scavenge down here, Pima said. We see their logo all the time. Them, them and General Electric and Fluid Design and Kuwak LG. Everyone's always talking about keeping quota so their blood buyers won't find another supply. Go across to, to Bangladesh or Ireland, Lawson and Carson won't even supply filter masks because they say that they've got to keep costs low. I don't know, Nita looked embarrassed. It's a corporate priority to source from recycled materials vendors, she hesitated. Shipbreaking would be one possible trade source for raw components, she looked away. I've never really followed that side of the company. 
You goddamn swank. Pima's face had turned harsh. You're lucky we didn't know who you were when you were still lying under that bedroom furniture. Leave her alone, Pima. He was feeling worse, feeling tired and nauseous. We got bigger problems. He pointed to the horizon. Check it out. Pima and Anita turned. All three of them stared across the sand flats to where the last of the tide was trickling away. From the direction of the ship breaking yards, a crew of people was heading toward them. Eight, eight, or ten, all in a knot. That your crew coming for you, Pima asked. Maybe your blood buyer people. Nita ignored the jive and craned her neck to see, to stare across the waters. I can't tell. She scrambled into the ship and came back with a spyglass. She trained it on distant walking forms. I'm seeing a lot of scars and tattoos. Your people? Pima took the glass and peered through. Well, Nita pressed. Is it one of your scavenge crews? Pima shook her head. Worse than that, she handed the spyglass to Naylor. What do you mean worse? Nita asked. Naylor cradled the spyglass in his good hand and peered at the distant beach. The view slid over, reflecting sand and salt, and salt water pools until he found the figures hurrying across. He focused on the faces and found the leader. Blood and rust, he cursed softly. What's wrong? Nita asked again. Who is it? Pima sighed. Is dead. Okay. I think this is a good place to stop. Okay, I'm wrapping up here. I think so. What do you think? Uh, you're a little over two hours, and I think we had a good turnout tonight. Awesome. So, how's everyone enjoying so far? I hope you all have uh, have been liking us. Um, hmm. I realize that this book is a bit shorter than The Wind-Up Girl. How far into it are you? Uh, looks like I'm about a third of the way through. Oh, nice. Yep. Won't be long before we're finished. Yep. Um, yeah, should be able to. And I should be getting uh, wind up back from my sister. So if it turns out that people uh, like this, I can jump to wind up or something else if someone has a suggestion um, and see how that goes. Uh, but that is where we will stop now. Got a new character in the mix. Well, I thank everyone who came out. I hope you are enjoying. If you missed any any of it or want to watch it over, it should be posted on um, uh, Party White Gaming uh, to complete watching. And if this does turn out to be an ongoing thing, then I will try dueling myself a little little image I can sit in this little seat right next to that fluffy calico. Ooh, I even see our goal at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we filled up really quickly uh, yesterday. We were six away from unlocking more emotes. Nice. So, Ren, what do you think about it? Very interesting. I want to know more about Lucky Girl and her family's shenanigans. I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. I'm invested in this story. Yeah, so basically what she said is, yeah, I'm the kid of one of the richest people on the planet who prob who makes money through your blood and sweat yep. and death. Yeah, yeah, she, she is a, a welfare baby who is profiteering, or not profiteering, but has lived her life of luxury based on their hard work and suffering. Mm-hmm. One of those who basically does not know that. <laughs> She's like, I had no idea. Yeah. Or so she claims. 
I guess we'll or find so out. Or so she claims. But we'll find out uh, if she's telling the truth or not later. We'll get to meet more characters. We'll get to see how awful Naylor's dad is. Um, more awful? More awful. He gets super awful. Um, but um, I'm, I, I, I think... I think next time we'll get to meet uh, my second favorite character of this book, uh, which is which is Tool, the the half man, because he he's just awesome. I like him. He's basically he's basically what a familiar is in um, in uh, Forest, except that instead of magic, he was science like science. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that, you know, they do. It's like poor people sell their eggs and they do genetic creation to make servant people. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And I believe in this world, I think the. I forget what company. Because they got a number of companies. Uh, Lawson and Carlson is one of the big ones that's that's got like their hands dipped in so many things for a calorie company. Um, but then like what they do on the sur- surface is just like a front for what they uh, what they're really doing, which is you know collecting calories. Um, then there's because like if if I do get to the wind up girl, we get to meet one of the one of the people who actually does the genetic modification. But um, but yeah, there's a number of interesting characters, genetically modified and not. And I think um, hmm, yeah, we'll we'll uncover more of that. But, um, but yeah, so we'll pick up on this next week. Thanks everyone for coming out. Yes, thank you everyone. It's been fantastic having people take part in listening to Shay reading and having uh, discussions in the chat. It was greatly appreciated, and I'm glad you all stopped by. Yep, I'm very happy for that. Um, so tomorrow, I believe we're back to Descent to Avernus. Uh, yes, that is correct. We will be back into Descent. They have uh, some cultists to go meet. That'll be interesting. Um, so uh, I will. I also have a um, have my my Twitter up um, at Jim Shea, even though it's Shea Jim. It decided to flip it over backwards, but yeah, whatever. Um, but at at Jim Shay, I do do some some artwork and drawing. Uh, so if you're interested, have a look, have a follow. Um, if you want anything done, I do do commissions. Um, you should make a I just page I I recently point. learned how to do like little world map stuff, which uh, which I'm new at, but I've got one posted up there of a nice big old continent. Um, I also do character art uh, and other things as well. Um, you, and should, you should make a commission page and pin it so that people can see what your rates are. Yeah, um, it's it, yeah. A lot of it depends on. Yeah, I'll come up with like a base uh, basis. I think I'll have it relatively, you know, negotiable depending on how much detail is wanted or added to it. Um, uh, cause nor- normally like when I, when I, when I've done, uh, commissions, it's, you know, folks tell me what they want and, um, I estimate, you know, how much, you know, how much time and effort needs to go into this and say, yeah, it's about, it would be about this. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll come up with a, with a base, um, and, and things can be adjusted as necessary. But yep, thank you everyone. Have a great evening.
Uh, this has been great. Let's see if there's anybody still running that we can raid. Ah, oh, yes. Gerald for us all is raiding a game, so we'll go over to him. He's given us some support and love before, so we'll jump in. They're just playing D&D, so feel free to hang out, watch them. Uh, you're cutting out a bit, Ren. Oh, it's because I'm not pushing the push to talk, sorry. We're gonna go raid Jero for, for us all. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Love you all. Good night, folks.